Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Burkus again for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Each week or each time, I tell two or three stories that give you a moral, an opportunity to see somebody else, an entrepreneur that has either failed miserably or succeeded wildly, and sometimes you get insights to take home for you from some of these things that we tell. So we'll tell real stories about real entrepreneurs. So I've got three of them for you this week, if I can do them fast enough. The first one, unfortunately, is about myself. So I had a company that produced computer systems for hotels. In fact, it was the largest computer system provider for hotels in the United States at the time. And we produced about 22% of all of the automated hotels in the United States, 16% of all the automated hotels in the world at the time when I finally sold the company. But on the way up, we went from 2 million to 4 million to 8 million to 12 million in sales year by year to a point where the company outgrew itself. And this is where the story gets a little bit turned. Because as the company grew faster and faster, you might imagine that support in a hotel or for a hotel has to be 24 hours. And you can't wait even a minute to answer the telephone because the person on the other end can be sitting, standing at a front desk with people waiting to check into the hotel. So our problem was, as we grew, we didn't hire enough trained people for the support staff. Now, can you imagine that every salesperson from every competitor anywhere on earth would have found that out instantly and begun to use those examples against us? Well, they did. And so as we grew and got that reputation of not being able to support our own systems, we had to do something about it and did. And it took us about six months to hire, train, and in the end, turn out better quality than we had before. And yet, I've got to ask you a question. How long do you think, with all of that noise being made by those competitive salespeople, it took for the customers, to, or the ultimate customers, the prospects, to begin to realize that we had solved the problem that we created for ourselves? And the answer is two years. And so there really is a really strong moral in that kind of a story, and one that I had to learn the hard way. And that moral is, it is important to deliver first quality every single time. Because if not, everybody who wants to do you in is going to remember that and do something about it. So first quality every time you can. The second story is about a friend of mine. Her name is Kim Shepard. And Kim has a company called Decision Toolbox. It's a recruiting firm, a very unusual recruiting firm because it has 100 employees, not one of whom works from an office. Every one of the 100 employees works from home. So you might ask, how does a company organize itself to be able to manage 100 employees, none of whom are at the office, including executives, and still be able to put the output that it would have to to be able to make money and do well? A virtual company is a difficult company to manage. Kim has done a very good job, and what she's done is divide her employees into groups of five and have them report to each other once an hour, and they do it over Skype or they do it by texting or any other method that they choose among the group, and they end up having mutual ability to see who's working and who's working well. And then for the sales staff, she just lets them grade themselves because the commissions determine who's able to survive over time. And so Kim has created a virtual company with that 100 employees. And the lesson in that one is you can create a company virtually if you're willing to give up a little control and find some creative ways to make it happen. It has saved so much money over time that Kim can brag that she has a company that probably has lower overhead than virtually any of the other recruiting companies that have that many employees, at least, on Earth. I have time for one more story if I do, and this was one that uh, has a moral to it. I learned this. I'm a director at a university as well as many corporations. I'm a chairman of six companies and on the boards of 10 more. And in these board meetings, I've learned something really important. And the first thing that I learned happened to be because I went to a meeting of the company employees run by the CEO and sat quietly over in the corner. And it was a very quiet meeting. The employees weren't talking back, weren't raising their hands, and the CEO was kind of looking at me as if I had done something wrong. And so the day after the meeting, the CEO called me and he said, Dave, you know, I know you're chairman. I know you're one of the co-founders of this company, but the fact that you're sitting in in these employee meetings is dampening their spirit. And they're not talking like they do to me when I'm in the meeting and you're not there. So I'm going to ask you respectively, Dave, you are the chairman, but please don't come to the company meetings. Wow. You know, the end result of that one is I learned that there are times when you really have to be somewhere and times when you don't want to be somewhere. 
And there's another lesson that comes from this too. You know, if I had spoken up in those meetings and I'd given any kind of an order, and somehow that order was interpreted as one that was to be given around the CEO, one that should have been given to the CEO, there would have been hell to pay because the employees would have known that I was in charge and not the CEO. So the danger there is obviously that any board member needs to remember something that I hope you remember always. Noses in, fingers out. It's a very important lesson for all of us. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business, The Burkus Report.